Hello everyone and welcome back to Total Organic Chemistry. This video, I will be discussing the properties of ethers and how to synthesize them. So by the end of this video, the questions that you should be able to answer for yourself are what are the properties of ethers? How are those properties useful in organic chemistry? What are some methods to synthesize ethers? And what problems can arise from these different methods of ether synthesis? I will be talking a little bit about SN2 and SN1 mechanisms for these types of reactions, so if you'd like a little review on that, please go ahead and subscribe to my channel and take a look at some of my previous videos. Okay, so the general structure of an ether I can draw out here, where we have an oxygen atom in the middle, and then on either side of that oxygen atom, we will have two alkyl groups, so maybe R and R prime. And unlike alcohols, which have an OH bond, Ethers do not have any sort of OH bond, so that means they do not form hydrogen bonds with themselves. They are polar because of those lone pairs on the oxygen, but the lack of hydrogen bonds makes ethers very unreactive, which is one of their principal properties in organic chemistry. A very common ether is diethyl ether, right here, where we have just an oxygen atom in the middle and then two ethyl groups. And diethyl ether is a very common solvent in organic chemistry because it is unreactive. And because it does not have any hydrogen bonds, that makes it very nice for reactions that are sensitive to those protic solvents, like alcohols or water. So that is called a symmetrical ether, where each of the alkyl groups are the same. We also have asymmetrical ethers, where they're different. And another type of ether is called a crown ether. I can draw an example of one of those here, where we have sort of this six oxygen cyclic molecule where each of those oxygens has two ethyl groups attached to it, and it forms sort of this crown-like structure. And crown ethers are very useful because they actually can solvate metal ions very effectively, and that's because we have all of the lone pairs on the oxygen, and each of those lone pairs is pointing sort of in towards the middle of the crown ether, and that makes it very easy to solvate a metal ion in the middle. So for, for example, this particular crown ether solvates potassium ions very well. So that's just a side note, but it's something that is very useful to know. We can synthesize ethers through a few different methods. We've already learned about one of those methods, which is just by an SN2 reaction. So we could start with ethyl bromide, just an alkyl halide, and if we treat it with a strong nucleophile, such as sodium ethoxide, so remember alkoxide anions are very good nucleophiles, and that could displace the bromide in an SN2 mechanism to form just diethyl ether. And this reaction of an alkyl halide and an alkoxide anion to form an ether is called the Williamson ether synthesis. The Williamson ether synthesis is particularly useful for primary alkyl halides as well as unhindered alkoxides because those conditions will prevent elimination side reactions from happening. So if we have sort of a secondary or tertiary alkyl halide or a very sterically hindered base, that will likely undergo an E2 reaction, which will give us the alkene, remember, and not the ether. So if you're confused on why that happens, please go ahead and click at the top of the screen here where I discuss how to differentiate between all of these SN2, E2 reactions. We can also synthesize cyclic ethers using the Williamson ether synthesis. So if we have a molecule like this, where we have an OH and a halide in the same molecule, we can actually use an intramolecular Williamson ether synthesis to synthesize a cyclic ether. So in this case, we have a stereocenter here, where the bromine is coming out of the page towards us, and we can designate this as an R stereocenter. If you'd like some review on how to designate stereocenters as R or S, again, take a look at the video at the top of the screen. If we treat this with sodium hydroxide, what compound will this make? So let's figure this out here. We can draw a Newman projection where we have maybe our I here. I can just draw a little I pointing down these two carbons here. So that'll be our perspective. And drawing the Newman projection, we will have our front carbon with a methyl group pointing down, the bromine sort of pointing up and to the right, 
and a hydrogen up and to the left. And then the rear carbon again will have that OH going up, and then two hydrogens pointing to either side. Okay, so this tells us a lot about the SN2 reaction that we need. Because we know that SN2 reactions require a backside attack of the nucleophile to displace our leaving group, we know that this configuration is not going to undergo an SN2 reaction, because the OH, which will eventually be the nucleophile after deprotonation by the sodium hydroxide, is not anti to the bromine, which we need in order to get that backside attack. So what if we rotate the sort of rear carbon here to where the OH can be anti to the bromine? So again, we'll just have the front carbon be the same with all three substituents. And the rear carbon now will have the OH going down into the left and then the two hydrogens. Now we have an anti configuration where the OH will be able to attack the electrophilic carbon and kick off that bromine. So if we undergo that reaction, we can imagine the OH coming up to attack the sort of front carbon here, and then we will end up with a three-membered ring, and this is actually called an epoxide, where we have a three-membered ring with an oxygen in it. That's our cyclic ether. And from the Newman projection, we can determine that the methyl group will be pointing towards us on this left-hand carbon here. And then each other substituent will just be a hydrogen. So this tells us that this ring closing reaction is stereospecific because we end up with this specific enantiomer of this product here, which again we can designate as an R stereocenter. So again, we know that SN2 reactions are stereospecific. They involve inversion of stereochemistry, which means that we can produce specific enantiomers of products when we need to. Another way to synthesize ethers is through strong acids. So we can maybe start with ethanol here. And if we take two moles of ethanol and we use a sulfuric acid catalyst and also heat this reaction up, we can actually form diethyl ether again. So let's look at the mechanism by which this occurs. We start with our ethanol starting material, and then we have our sulfuric acid catalyst, and because that alcohol will be slightly basic, it will be protonated by the sulfuric acid to give us this version of the protonated ethanol with the oxygen with a plus formal charge. And then because that H2O is a good leaving group, we can have another molecule of ethanol acting as a nucleophile in an SN2 process, kicking off that water to give us this protonated ether. And then to get rid of that hydrogen, we need the most basic species we have in our reaction, and the most basic thing is probably going to be another molecule of ethanol. So that other molecule of ethanol will pull off the hydrogen to give us the diethyl ether product. So this is an easy way to form a symmetrical ether. It's very difficult to form asymmetrical ethers this way because you get a large mix of products but symmetrical ethers can be formed from either primary or secondary alcohols and a non-nucleophilic acid, such as sulfuric acid. Exposing tertiary alcohols to these reaction conditions will give more of the elimination product, and also exposing these alcohols to higher temperatures will also give more elimination products than substitution that we really want. However, we are able to get a pretty good yield of an asymmetrical ether using a tertiary alcohol and then a primary or secondary alcohol as the other half of the ether. So, for example, we could use tert butyl alcohol and ethanol, so we have one tertiary and one primary alcohol, and treating this with dilute sulfuric acid and water will give us a pretty good yield of this asymmetrical ether here. And this is possible because of pretty solid carbocation formation. So we can start with the tert butyl alcohol, and again, protonate it using our sulfuric acid to give us the protonated tert butyl alcohol. And since this is a tertiary center, the H2O leaving group will leave, giving us the pretty stable tertiary carbocation, which allows the ethanol, the primary alcohol, to come in in an SN1 process 
they give us the protonated ether, which again is deprotonated by maybe the terp-butyl alcohol or also the ethanol. So because of the stability of the tertiary carbocation, we can synthesize asymmetric ethers using a tertiary alcohol and also a primary or secondary one. So that wraps up my video on the properties and synthesis of ethers. Next time I will be taking a look at the reactions of ethers. If you enjoyed this video or learned something, please like and subscribe to my channel. Also, follow me on Facebook at Total Organic Chemistry and take a look at my website on the screen here. If you are able and willing, consider donating to my Patreon page. This really helps me to continue creating these contents for all of you. Thanks for watching.